But one thing I've learned, and that is this, is that you don't need a yesterday word, you need a now word. word. You need a today word. Now we know that God's word is forever settled in heaven. We know that God's word never gets old. It's always new. It was, it was a word for yesterday, and it'll be the word for today, and it's going to be the word for tomorrow. It's forever selling in heaven. But what we do need is a word for today. You need a word for today. I need a word for today, and I believe God has given us that tonight. And so I want to begin this, uh, this evening in the book of Malachi, in the book of Malachi, chapter number 3. And this is a familiar portion of Scripture to each and every one of us in here. And uh, us preachers, we love to quote this scripture. We love to preach this scripture. Amen. Because, you know, when I start hearing about first fruits, then it starts taking me back to the feast days. It starts taking me to back what, what first fruits mean. I mean, what they are. And we know that when God began to stir, uh, Brother Brian, he called me back up in September. I, I never will forget this. I had left, we have a, a booth at the Apple Festival we set up every year. And I had went over to get uh, some supplies, and Brother Brian called me, and uh, we, I just kind of pulled over there in the parking lot of the IGA and talked with him, and he began to speak to me about what God was doing in his heart, what God was doing in his spirit, and how God was just moving him at that particular moment, you know. I mean, he was broken. He was broken. He was seeking a word, and that word was to have a revival the first 13 days of the month of January. And I know that he's told you about it. I know he's preached to you about it. I know he's encouraged you. I know you've been fasting. I know you're, you're doing all that you're supposed to do, at least most of you are. And, and, and I know that. I know that some, are, no matter how many times you tell them, they're just not going to do it. They're just not. That's just the way they are. But we're going to talk a little bit about that tonight too. But the Bible says that we're two or three. Come together in his name, he's in the midst. So the Lord Jesus is here. And as He's here, He's here in the, in, in the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit. God is here. And, and, we, and we need to, to realize that He's here now. He's not a, a God a million miles away. He's not a God down the street. He's God here now. And I know He can be a million miles away. I know He can be down the street, but He's here now. Amen. And so that should help us to, to worship Him. But when we begin to think about first fruits, first fruits, I mean, it's self, ex, uh, self-explanatory. I mean, it's defined first fruits. This is the first of the year. God was the one that instituted time. God gave us years, and He gave us years so that you and I could come to the conclusion of a year and start all over again. And we know that it's in us because, you know, as we, we, do, we, we get so busy towards the end of the year and it just seems like everything comes uh, comes crashing down on us and, 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 you know, we enjoy the holidays, we look forward to the holidays, but we get to the point where we're just glad to get through the holidays, you know, into the brand new year because we've got New Year's resolutions, we've got some things we'd like to try again, we've got some goals that we'd like to accomplish, and God gave that to us as a gift. 2013 is a gift. Yes. Now, most of you that know me, um, for years I've been studying numbers in the Bible, Bible numerics, and I believe there's a language there as well as messages there that God wants us to see. And and so we know we just come out of 2012, and 2012 represents governmental perfection. But 13, the number 13, some people call it lucky 13, some people it's unlucky 13. But what the number 13 represents in the Bible is depravity and rebellion. That's what the number 13 represents in the Bible. And you say, oh, brother Jeff, you don't give me a downer. No, 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 no. Just because other people are depraved don't mean you have to be. Just because other people are in rebellion doesn't mean you have to be in rebellion. Amen? Amen. So think about that. Now as we look here in Malachi chapter number 3, verse number 6, I want to read down through verse number 12. And we've got, we've got a few scriptures that we want to, to talk about tonight that are going to help us kind of to bring this message together. I was kind of tempted to, to text Brother Brian and say, you know, making sure I didn't overlap Brother Troy's tech, his, his scriptures last night. But I said, I'm not going to do that. Amen. I, I, no, get away from me, enemy. I knew that was coming from. Because, see, I want to know what God has in store for us tonight. Amen. Amen. And I just know that God has a way of, of tying things together and bringing them together. But I, but I will say, now, uh, I've come with a hard word tonight. Amen. A very hard word. And most of the time, those are the type of messages I preach. I can get happy, 
I can get glad, amen, but I can get hard. And, and there's a word I use. I'm not going to pussyfoot around it either, amen. So we're not going to walk lightly as a cat. We're going to deal with it, all right? We're going to deal with it. And so my, one of my favorite expressions is, is that if it lands in your lap, then you deal with it. If whatever said, if it lands in your lap and you feel conviction, don't get mad at me, don't get mad at Brian, don't get mad at anybody else. Just walk back there to that bathroom, go right there in front of that mirror and take a good long look at your biggest problem, amen? Take a good long lick. look, amen. Don't lick the mirror, please. All right. I know for some of you it's hard to be humble, but amen. Now, verse 6. For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Even from the days of your fathers, ye are gone away from mine ordinances and have not kept them. Return unto me, and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. But ye said... Wherein shall we return? Now, do you not see the backslidden condition of these folks? They didn't even know that they had gotten away or gone away from the ordinances of God. And the Bible says, will a man rob God? Will a man rob God? You know, the unfortunate thing here just a few minutes ago, some of you robbed God in the church. You didn't give Him the praise that was due unto His name. Amen. We were in praise and worship. We were being led into praise and worship. And often at times, our praise and worship is dictated upon how we feel. So if we've had a bad day or a tough day or a rough day, we come to church and, and we're, just, we're just like an old knot on the log and we don't give God its glory, the glory it's doing to His name. But, but get this, it don't matter what kind of day you had. He still deserves the glory. It don't matter. And that when you and I come to church and we begin to understand that, so what that the boss fussed at you? So what you didn't pass the test at school? Listen, I know those things are important, but when, it, when we come into God's house, He has to have the priority, the preeminence, the first place. We have to lift Him up and exalt Him. And if we do that, then we get those things in the right perspective that we need to. Now, will a man rob God? It says, ye have robbed me, but ye say, where and have we robbed thee? And he starts off in tithes and offerings, right off the bat, amen, in tithes and offerings. Did you not hear the quietness come over this place when I said tithes and offerings? <laughs> amen, he's going to get in my pocketbook, yes, probably before it's over, with I will. Now, I know that you guys are not taking up an offering this, this, this week, all right? But now, at the end of this revival, you're going to get a chance to give an offering. You're going to get a chance to give a tithe and, and give an offering, and understand that one of the ways we worship God is through our tithes and offerings. Right. Amen? Because it bugs a fire to me as a preacher. And this is for somebody. God's had on my spirit t twice or three or four times a day. I mean, we can go and watch a Kenny Chesney concert and pay 60 bucks <laughs> for a ticket. Anybody saying, ouch yet? Amen? And then come to church. And you got some of the finest musicians and singers in this area. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I mean, God has blessed you. And the offer plate go by, you might give $5. You're stealing. You're robbing from God. Amen. Your priorities are all messed up. You got to get things in the, in the right perspective. You do. Now, now later on, as, as, as God leads us and the Holy Spirit leads us, we probably will take up an offering, but it won't be the kind that you're used to. It'll be, it'll be an offering that some of you have, have experienced as we've led you on an Emmaus walk or... And it won't cost you any money. It'll just cost you a little bit of energy. Just cost you a little bit of time to give God glory into His name. The Bible says, because they have robbed God, it says, ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. So when you and I rob from God, we rob from our nation. When we rob from God, we rob from our family. And what that means is, is we withhold the blessing. If I'm a husband, and I am, and my lovely wife Carmen is right here with me tonight, if, if I don't lead her in giving of tithes and offerings, I rob from her the blessings that God wants to bestow upon her. Amen? And if I, if I don't give my tithes and my offerings, I rob it from my family, from my sons and my daughter-in-laws and my grandchildren. And then it even goes farther. Then I rob from my nation. Amen? I rob from my nation. I rob from my people. Now, here's what I want to do. Now, when I'm preaching to this section, I want y'all to say, 
I got you back, Brother Jeff. Amen? Because I know some of you are looking at me. All right, when, I, when I'm preaching to this section, I want this section to say, all right, amen, amen, because we'll get on some things here in just a minute that you're really going to be needing to pray for the group I'm looking at. <laughs> amen, because I'm going to have something for them, but then when I turn around, I'm going to have something for you. So they're not going to need to really be praying for you when that happens. Now, the Bible says, Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Yes. All right. Go with me there. And I will pour you, and it says, and I will pour you out a blessing. Now, and it says, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. And all nations shall call you blessed, for ye shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. Now, the title of the message tonight that I want to give to you is found there in verse number 10, where it says, it says in the Scriptures, If I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing. Now, back a few weeks, a few days ago, actually, last Sunday, as we were praying over a couple, and, and we were praying over a couple because of tithes and offerings. And we were praying over them. God spoke to our spirit, and this is what he said. He said, pray over them an open windows blessing. Pray over them an open windows blessing. And tonight, that's when we'll pray over you. Because I felt like that was a word not only for them, but that was a word for Pine Grove as a church, for the people of Pine Grove as a church. Because I, I speak to them how that I want them to have uh, health and wealth and favor. I want God to bless them with health and wealth and favor. But also, I believe it's for this church. I believe it's for this revival. An open window blessing. And, and we know in scriptures that when, when we know that, that when, when Jacob... Uh, put his head up on the rock and he saw the ladder that went up to heaven, he saw what? The angels ascending and descending. Why? Because there was an open heaven. There was an open heaven that he was able to see. And I believe that there are times that the heavens open up for us. And I believe because, see, not only does the number 13 represent depravity and rebellion, but also... 2013 is going to be a year of restoration. A year of restoring what Satan has taken away from you. I mean, take it, I mean, he's going to give it back. Amen. He's going to give it back. So, so I want you to realize that it's 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 from, from what I gather uh, that, that people that operate in the prophetic realm and, and people that, that are praying in these 24-hour services that are 365 days a year, I mean, that's what they're hearing is, is restoration. Now, every one of us in here have lost something. Every one of us in here, Satan has got something from us. Every one of us in here needs something to be restored. You know, when I said something a minute ago about my voice, if the enemy tries to take my voice, I need it to be restored. Brother George needs his health restored. Yeah. Amen. Because, see, I, I'm kind of at the place. I, I love Brother George, and I know that, 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 that he loves the Lord, and I know his, his family loves him. But, but when I begin to see God's people get sick, and, and I begin to see them struggle, then I get to a place that sometimes I don't know what to pray other than this. God, if you're not going to heal them, take them home. Yeah, right. Amen. And I know that might be kind of tough, but listen. For me to live is Christ, but to die is to gain. Can you imagine what waits for him the moment he closes his eyes on this side of eternity and goes home to be with the Lord? Amen. And I know that, that, that God will prepare his family when that day comes, but, but, but me personally, I'm a little bit selfish, and I want to keep him here, and, and I want to work with him some more, but, but we know it's not my will. But thy will be done according to the scriptures is what God teaches us. So tonight, I want to preach to you for a little while about an open window blessing. Now, if the door, if the window can be opened, then the window can be closed. Now, what would close that window? What would close that window is when you and I rob God. 
And when you and I rob God, we rob God through rebellion. Through rebellion. And the scripture that I want to give to you there is in 1 Samuel chapter number 15. 1 Samuel chapter number 15. I want you to, to write that down. But I want you to listen to what it says in verse number 22. It says, And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected thee from being king. So, if you and I are in church, and are we, in, and we are in rebellion, then we are practicing witchcraft in the church. We are practicing witchcraft in God's house. Now, it is what it is. And whatever you and, how, you, whatever you and I see, we have to see it in light of the Scripture. Because, see, this church, as, long as, as well as the church that I pastor, we're either going to be culturally relevant or we're going to be biblically relevant. Right. And, and, and we, we don't need any more culturally relevant churches. We need churches that are biblically relevant. Churches that are going to stand upon the Word of God and not going to compromise. They're not going to back up. They're not going to let up. They're not going to shut up, even though it may become very unpopular. Because, see, I would rather be on God's side than the world's side. I'd rather stand with God than the ways of the devil. And see, you and I, that's the reason why Joshua said, choose this day whom you're going to serve. Because, see, they would have followed Joshua anyway, anywhere he took them. Because the anointing of Moses was upon Joshua. They would have followed him. But see, Joshua understood something. This has to be a personal decision. I'm not going to make it for you anymore. You have to choose this day whom you're going to serve. And guess what? Brother Brian can't make it for you anymore either. Your mom and daddy can't make it for you anymore. There comes a time that you have to make your own personal decision. Choose this day whom you're going to serve. Now, did Jesus ever deal with, with rebellion and depravity in the Scriptures? We know that He did. We know that by the fact that when He walked upon this earth, He didn't walk among the religious crowd. He walked among the outcasts of society, the throwaways, the people nobody wanted. Those are the ones He walked among. He walked among the lepers. He walked among the sick. He walked among the diseased. He walked among those that were living in moral lifestyles. He walked among the needy, not among the religious. Matter of fact, He really got on the religious crowd, didn't He? He got on them because they had, they had lost their way. They had, they had forgotten the Word. They had forgotten what God, reason why God had brought them into existence, why God had put them here. And, and guess what? Churches can do that. We can forget why God put us here. We can forget why the founding fathers decided to build El Elkhorn Baptist Church here. Because, see, this is a work. Elkhorn Baptist Church is a work. I mean, and God needs workers, amen. And when you, when you become a member of the church, you are agreeing that you will come, will become workers of the church. But we know that a very small percentage of any church does the majority of the work in the church which is a shame. Yes, Amen. And, you know, and, and, you know I, I say this jokingly at times, but I say it because I want you to understand how real this is. See, I got saved when I was almost 28 years old. And when I left this, this part of the country, I went into the Air Force. All of my education was in law enforcement. All of my education, all of my training was in law enforcement. And, and, and actually, I turned down a job in Washington with the Secret Service to come back to Kentucky. But come to know the Lord after I got back here. Come to know Jesus. Because, see, I had religion, but I didn't have relationship. I mean, I came from a conservative Baptist church. My name was on the roll. I was a founding member. But then truly, didn't truly know Jesus Christ as my Savior. But God led us back, and we come to know Christ. And I, and I remember when I got saved in February, and it was around March or April, my pastor stood up and said, you know what, I'm going to start a jail ministry, and I need some help. I said, I'll help. I didn't know you could say no. I just figured the pastor said he wanted help. You're supposed to say, I'll help. Amen. You're supposed to step up. You're supposed to step up and me. If he's your leader, 
and you look at him as your leader and you respect him as your leader, then you follow the leader. Amen. Amen. Because the pastor is that under-shepherd that God has placed over the church. And see, you know, when, when, I, when I got the, to, to looking at the definitions of depravity and rebellion, I, I wrote them down. And, and the definition of depravity is a corrupt act or practice, an evil or immoral act. Now, I'm going somewhere with this. Rebellion is opposition to one in authority. Opposition to one in authority or dominance and open-armed and usually unsuccessful defiance or resistance to an established government. But what I, what I like about that is this. It says a armed defiance. How do we arm ourselves against our leaders? By the words that come out of our mouth. Because see, it's the reason why the Bible teaches us that, that if I have hate or ought in my heart against a brother, that's like committing murder. That if I speak against my brother, that's like committing murder. And my Bible says, touch not my anointing and do my prophets no harm. Because, see, then we begin to get caught up in that rebellion. And church, as I, as I look at this scripture and I think about this open window's blessing, then God took me to another portion of scripture. And this portion of scripture is found in the book of Mark, chapter number 7, as Jesus deals with 13 different types of sin. <laughs> 13 different types of sin. Now, my, my preference... Uh, as a Bible to preach from and teach from is the KJV. Even though I have the, the, the New King James Version, I have the NIV, I have different, different versions of the Bible. But I, I guess since I cut my teeth on this version, this is the version that I'm always in. And when I'm in it, I'm always counting numbers. And I'm always looking at things. And so if you look within Mark chapter number 7, I want you to see something. The Bible says here in Scripture in verse number 13... <laughs> Mark chapter 7 and verse number 13, it says this. Making the word of God of none effect through your tradition, which ye have delivered, and many such like things do ye. And when he had called all the people unto them, he said unto them, Hearken unto me, every one of you, and understand. There is nothing from without a man that entering into him can defile him. But the things which come out of him, those are they that defile the man. And I know that a lot of people use scriptures like this to justify their drinking, so to speak. However, you and I know that the more drink you put in, the less inhibitions you have and the more stupid you become. Amen. 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 That's just the way that it is. <laughs> Praise God. And, and, and listen, uh, we, 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 we own a school over in Casey County right now. And back over the Christmas holidays, we had three teenagers vandalize that school. And the reason why they vandalized that school is because a 14-year-old girl stole her daddy's liquor and went and got drunk with the two boys. And they went on a vandalizing spree. So before you start using Scripture to justify what you're doing, you better look at the whole context of the Scripture and understand what God's trying to tell you. Amen? You need to know the Word. Remember, church, if this is, an, if, if, if this is a time of an open windows blessing, then we don't want to close that window. And one of the ways you close that window is through open defiance and rebellion. And rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. But the Bible says to obey God, to obey Him, and, and, and to hearken to Him. That's what God is. He said it's better than sacrifice. That's what God said. It's better than sacrifice for those that are willing to be obedient unto Him. Now, as we look at this scripture, we read down. It says, if any man have ears to hear, let him hear. And when he had entered into the house from the people, his disciples asked him concerning the parable. And he saith unto them, Are ye so without understanding also? Do ye not perceive that whatsoever thing from without entereth into the man, it cannot defile him, because it entereth not into his heart, but into his belly, and goeth out into the draught, purging all meats? And he said, 
That which cometh out of a man, that defileth a man. For within, out of the heart of men, proceed, number one, evil thoughts. Evil thoughts. Now, how can we expect God to rain down blessings upon us if our thoughts are evil? The Bible says that man's heart is wicked. And who can know it? And so let me ask you a question tonight. You, you know this thing on top of your head, on your shoulders, God gave you as a brain. But you and I know this, that the battle wages between the ears. And as a man thinketh in his heart, so he becomes. That's what the Word of God says. And the Bible teaches us that that is one of the acts of rebellion. is stinking thinking. And evil thoughts. And you know what? I could define many types of evil thoughts, but I don't think I have to do that, do I? All right? I think you know what I'm talking about because we need to move on. But look what it says here in Scripture. So the Bible says whatever things are pure and honest and good, we're to what? Think on those things. Those things that are good, those things that are honest, and those things that are pure. Your eyes, your ears, your mouth, your nose, those are gateways into your soul, into the person that you are. The person I see is not the person that you are. Because we have a good way of dressing this person up, but the real man's on the inside. And something I learned a long time ago when I was listening to a preacher preach, he said this, he said, you are who you are when you are alone. Whatever you're thinking, that's who you really are. That's who you really are. When you don't got to impress anybody and you're sitting at home or driving down the road, whatever's going through your mind and that's what you're thinking on, that's who you really are. But I'm going to tell you something. That's a wake-up call. Because, see, whatever you're watching on TV at night when mom and dad's gone to bed or wife has gone to bed or husband's gone to bed or whatever you're doing on the computer, that's who you really are. That's who you're becoming. Amen. And let me tell you something. If it's wrong, if it was wrong yesterday, it's still wrong today. If God said it was wrong 2,000 years ago, it's still wrong right now. It hasn't changed. Just because society puts their stamp of approval upon it and says it's okay doesn't make it okay. Whatever we do, got to line up with the book. Look at the second one. The second one says this, adultery. Did you hear the crickets? Amen. I know this church has battled through that. Most all churches in the area have battled through that. Because see, as our society continues to, 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 to sink into depravity, these things are going to be all around us. A depraved condition. We know that our society is getting more and more depraved. When no longer a man is satisfied with a woman or his wife, no longer a woman is satisfied with her husband, and then they start seeking relationships with the same sex. Read Romans chapter number 1 and see what God says about that. I told you this was going to be a hard word. I told you. And I know Campbellsville is a college town. And I know Campbellsville is eat up with it. I know that Columbia is a college town. And they're eat up with it. I know Danville is a college town. And they're eat up with it. But it still doesn't make it right. And I know you've got family members. You've got people you know caught up in it. So do I. But it still doesn't make it right. Amen. You have to choose this day where you're going to stand. If not, you get caught up in the same rebellion that they're in. You get caught up in it as well by sympathizing with it. Good preaching, Holy Spirit. The Bible says fornifications. Fornifications. And you know what? Listen to me, young people. It's wrong. I don't care if your best girlfriend then lost her virginity. I don't care, young man, if your best friend had lost his virginity with some girl. It does not give you the okay to go out and lose yours. Fornification is sex outside of marriage. But we know today that so many of our young people are losing something so precious to them at a very early age. God frowns on it. God frowns on it. 
And so see, once again, rebellion. Rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft. Depravity. Depravity. Think about that just for a moment. The word goes on. And look what it says. It goes down and it says murders. And I already said, if you and I speak evil against our brothers and our sisters, it's like an act of murder. It's an act of murder. You are, you are trying to destroy their reputation. You're not trying to destroy their name. You're trying to destroy them. You're trying to kill them in some form or some fashion. And it goes on and it says thefts. It's never right to steal. Do not steal. Do not. It's never right to do it. I don't care if it's a cookie. Amen. I don't care. Listen, and that's the reason my moms and dads, you have to be careful about laughing at this stuff because then you make it seem like it's okay and it's so cute. Well, it ain't so cute when they're taking money out of your wallet. It ain't so cute when they're stealing from the Christmas fund. It might have been cute when they were elbow deep in the cookie jar when you caught them when they were one or two years old. But it ain't cute anymore. So that's the reason why you got to deal with it quick. You got to deal with it. Why? Blessings. Because, see, one thing I've learned about the Bible is I don't understand it all, but I know it works. And if I apply its principles to my life, it works. And if I apply the principles to my children's life, it works. I don't understand how, how, how all of it comes together. I just know God is God. And, and God, will, is, he, he loves his word and Jesus is the word. And if I do the word, it, it works. I just know that. I just know that. You know, and then the Bible says, covetedness. Covetedness. And church, do not we deal with that in our society? You know, the God in America is, is the God of the mighty dollar. What can I buy that's bigger than better? Amen. I'm like most of you all. I've got an I've got a, a, a iPhone. They're starting to come out with an iPhone 6. I just got an iPhone 4. <laughs> Amen. But see, if I'm not going to care if I want the iPhone 6, forget about the iPhone 5. Covenants. Do I really need an iPhone 6? Do you really need an iPhone 6? Think about that just for a moment. There's a difference between a want and there's a difference between a need. The word goes on and it says this in Scripture. It says wickedness, wickedness. Church, any, anything that you and I do that's wrong and contrary to the word fits in that category. It's wickedness, wickedness. The Bible says deceit. Satan is the author. He's a liar and the father of it. And, you know, church, I, I do this little test all the time, and most of you know about this, but this is for the ones that don't know. How many of you in here know that God loves you? Raise your hand. Yeah. How many of you know in here that Satan hates you? Yeah. Then why you keep falling then? Why you keep doing the things that you know that's wrong? Why? Deception. Deception. Deceit and deception. Open windows blessings. You said you wanted that blessing. Well, I'm going to tell you something. It comes with a price. Yes. It comes with a price. See, God ain't as free with his resources as you and I might be with our resources. Amen? Sometimes as parents, we don't, we draw a line, but we back up and draw another line, and we back up and we draw another line, and we back up and we draw another line. But there has to come a time you got to draw a line. And you don't back up from that line. There has to be something you got to stand on if you want to be blessed. Church, when we look at this cross, do you not know that Jesus had to die on a cross for our sins? So if Jesus had to die for our sins, why should we take a lackadaisical look at sin and think that we can do just any old thing and still be blessed? No, because like I told you, you rob yourself, you rob your family, you rob your community, you rob your nation when you don't do... Well, you say, why call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I tell you? Why call me Lord, Lord, and do not what I tell you to do? And we prayed that in the prayer, didn't we? That one day every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus is Lord. Is He your Lord? Yes, sir. Then if He's your Lord, you're doing what He tells you to do, not what you want to do. 
but what God wants you to do. Jesus gave us the prime example the night before he was to die, and he sweat great drops of blood. What did he say? Not my will, but thy will be done. Not what I want, but what you want. Giving God the first place to preeminence in his life. And he is God. He's God's only begotten son. An open windows blessing. An open windows blessing. The Bible says this. He said, prove me if I will not open up the windows and pour out. If you look at that scripture, the pour out means empty. That God will empty out a blessing on you. Not only give you part of the blessing, not half of it, not three quarters of it. God wants you to have all of it. God wants Elkhorn Baptist to have all the blessing that he has for this church. Not part of it here and there. Not part of it this month and next month. God wants to pour it all out today upon this church. But he can't if you're not in a place that you can handle it. Amen? Listen to me. I have the Holy Spirit inside of me. The third person of the Godhead. And if you're a born-again believer, he's in you. The same Holy Spirit that was in Jesus is the same Holy Spirit that's in you. The same Holy Spirit that done all the miracles that Jesus did is in you. The same Holy Spirit that caused Jesus to walk upon the water is in you. The same Holy Spirit that the Bible says that if all the things that Jesus had done had been written down, there would be enough, enough books to contain them, is in you. And if the, the same Holy Spirit is in us, then why are we not doing the same things he did? You know what I'm saying? He can't pour that blessing out upon you if you can't walk under it. If you can't handle it. If you can't handle the anointing. If you can't handle the mantle that God wants to release upon you. If you can't handle it, he's not going to give it to you. Do you not know that God did not take Elijah till Elisha was ready? For the double portion. He asked for the double, didn't he? So God had to get him ready for the double portion. Not the single, but the double. And we keep asking God for things that he wants to give us, but he can't. Because we're not ready. We're not ready. I believe God's given you guys this 13 days to get you ready. To get you ready. To get you ready for what he wants to do at Elkhorn Baptist Church. I mean, Elkhorn and Pine Grove is like a lot of other churches. We're dancing at the threshold, but we're just not walking through the door. Amen? We're dancing and we're up there. We're ready to go to that next level, or we think we are, but for some reason, the door's not open. But did not Jesus say that he's the door? Did not he say that we can go in and out? And find pasture. Didn't he say that in the scriptures? That once that door swings open and you and I are able to walk through it, then God it places that at a level spiritually that I can go in and out that door. Up and down that ladder. Amen. God showed me a picture that one time. God showed me a, 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 like a vision and a dream of, of people ascending and descending. And I knew what I saw. I knew what I saw. Because, see, God wants us to get to that place that we can handle the spiritual blessing. And, see, 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 most churches cannot handle what a preacher really wants to preach to them because they're not spiritually mature enough to handle it. So we have to hold back because we, we, we're constantly giving them milk when we want to give them meat. But, see, we need to be to that place where we get past the milk. And we want the meat. And Jesus deals with it in that scripture right there, Mark chapter number 7. He deals with 13 different kinds of sin. Rebellion and depravity. All of them deal with rebellion and depravity. Every one of them. Every one of them. So see, the 13, the number 13 can be a year of depravity and rebellion. Now, I know today in so many of our church circles that, that, that you know, so many of God's men and are preaching that, you know, America's going down. Well, I'm going to tell you something. God brought Israel into existence. God brought America into existence. And if America goes down, 
It's because this church and my church and other churches are not doing what they're supposed to be doing. Because the, 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 the condition of this nation will rise and fall as the condition of the church. And if the church gets right with God, we'll see America come back to God. And we'll see America change. But we're quick to condemn. We're, we're quick to do that when we need to understand that the responsibility rests upon us if my people is what God said. Because see, not everybody I go to church with is God's people. Not everybody you go to church with is God's people. I hope everybody I'm looking at, your God's the same as my God's. But I know at the crowd this size, chances are some of you are not. Amen. See, it could be. That we're not on the same page, and if the rapture took place today, you'd be left behind. Amen. Yeah. Amen. And, I, and, and, and I'll get to that in just a minute. All right. <laughs> Y'all was waiting on it, wouldn't you? It says this, lasciviousness, filthiness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, and foolishness. Thirteen different types of sin. Now... Once again, when I think about the word first fruits, first fruits is, is also called the feast of weeks or the feast of first fruits. That's what it's called. But if you look at, look at the scriptures, how they unfold, Jesus Christ was crucified on the Passover. He was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. So see... Bible theologians estimate that there was approximately one million people from across the world had gathered at Jerusalem at the Passover. And while they were nailing the true Lamb of God to the cross, they were sacrificing thousands of lambs at the temple. And they were cutting their blood, their necks, the blood drained in a basin. They were going through their religious, religious rituals and religious practices and not even knowing that the Lamb of God was fixed to be hung up on the cross for the sins of the whole world. But they knew something was wrong when it went dark. They knew they missed something when it got dark. They knew that they missed something that when the lights came back on, that the veil was ripped from the top to the bottom, not from the bottom to the top. But see... Also, the Feast of First Fruits is also, it, it deals with the Feast of Pentecost. The Bible teaches me in Acts chapter number 2, look what happened here. Verses number 1 through 4. Acts chapter 2, verses number 1 through 4, look what it says. The Bible says in this scripture, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, was fully come, it's so important that you, that, that you understand that. They were all with one accord in one place. One of the reasons why you're gathering through this 13-day time, uh, time span of days is to bring you in unity in one accord. For God to bring you in unity in one accord so that He can open up the windows of heaven. Now, Jesus had already visited the men in the upper room. Not once, but twice. He came through the door. He came into the room, never walked through the door. But yet he ate with them. But one was missing, and his name was Thomas. And when, when the disciples told Thomas that Jesus had come, he didn't believe. So Jesus came back just for him. So see, then the Bible teaches us that they were in this room in unity in one accord only after the day of Pentecost had fully came. And look what happened. Look what happened. The Feast of first fruits deals directly with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The outpouring of the Holy Ghost. Where God would not be, not, not be a God a million miles away, but He'd be a God with you. Remember that, that the Bible says they call Jesus' name Emmanuel because He's God with us. The two main reasons why Jesus was born into this world was to forgive us of our sins and to be with us. Yeah, right. To forgive us of all of our sins, past, present, future, to put them under the blood and to walk with us. And for three and a half years, Jesus walked with His disciples. 
But he introduced them or began to introduce them to the Holy Spirit through John 14, 15, and 16. And he called him the Spirit of Truth. He called him the Holy Ghost. He called him the Comforter, the Counselor, that he would be with you, he would guide you, he would lead you, he would direct you to forgive us of our sins, but to be with us, to be with us. We sung there a minute ago, Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. Do we really want the Holy Spirit here? I mean, think about that, because he's going to mess you up when he gets here. I understand that. So see, when I, when, I, when, I, when I look at God, I say, Lord, I know you're going to mess me up, but mess me up, amen. I mean, just mess me up. I know it's going to happen, and I probably ain't going to like it, but I need it, amen. I know that I need it. Do you know that you need it? So see, then you've got to say, Holy Spirit, come, knowing he's going to mess you up. Hallelujah. Some of you ain't ready for that yet. You're not ready just to become all uncivilized in the church and let it all hang out. And I'm not talking about your, your boobs either, amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. You need to cover that stuff up anyway. <laughs> Praise Jesus. Yeah, y'all letting stuff hang out, but the wrong kind of stuff. Pray, that's good preaching too. Making some of you squirm a little bit, but it's good anyway. The Bible says, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were with all one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. Well, what are y'all doing right now? Huh. So we can come in one accord in one place while we're sitting. Amen. The word goes on and it says, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire. And it sat upon each of them. That word cloven means divided. And it says in Scripture, like as a fire, it said, which looked like. And then the Bible says it sat upon me and it rested upon them. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Amen? The Bible says this, Come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you do you see the connection? You begin to see the connection of Scripture. God has come to give us rest in the church. Rest, but it's not like a rest that you and I would think laying in the lazy boy or laying back on the bed. It is a rest in doing what God has called you to do. Because I believe this, if you're in the center of God's will, doing what God called you to do, you can't mess it up. I believe that you can't mess it up. If you're doing what God has called you to do, then that is the path, the plan that he's laid out for you. And then it becomes impossible for you to mess it up. And you can rest in that. You can rest in the fact that, hey, listen, you don't have to talk like me. You don't have to preach like me. You don't have to sing like they sing or play musical instruments like they play. You rest in God and rest in your own abilities. Yes, doing what God has called you to do. That's when the blessings come down. That's when he opens them out and he begins to pour out those blessings upon you. And then see, then it's no longer a burden. Then it becomes a responsibility. See, sometimes we say, you know what, boy, I, I, you know, boy, it was a burden having to deal with them. Was it? Because, see, you're looking at it in the wrong perspective. If we're doing what God has called us to do, then it's a responsibility, not a burden. This was not a burden to Jesus. It was a responsibility. Because, see, he had to go to the cross so the blessings could come down. See, what God has called us to do is our responsibility. It's, resp it's something that we should love to do. I love to preach. I, I love to do what God has called me to do. I really do. That's the reason why when somebody asks me to do something, it's hard for me to say no. That's the reason why I work so many walks at times. Because it's hard to say no. Let me finish this up. It says, And it sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And we know, church, if you look at the Scriptures in the proper context here, when they begin to speak in tongues in this Scripture, they begin to preach in other languages that they had not been trained to do. 
Remember, approximately one million people were in Israel or in Jerusalem on the Passover. One million Jewish people or, or people from all over the world were in Jerusalem on the Feast of Pentecost. One million. So I know that when Peter got up and he preached and 3,000 come to know the Lord, that's only 3%. Let's stand in it. That was really in relationship to a million people a drop in the bucket. You know what I'm saying? Then he got up and preached again, 5,000 people. So now you got 8,000 people, and the early church is exploding. It's exploding, so they, they had to build. They had to build. They had to build. I'm going to get an amen over here in just a minute. From somebody, I'm going to get an amen. Amen, if you don't say amen to me, I'm going to come back there and stand on you. Listen, I know how, how that we begin to think, well, 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 Brother Jeff, if Jesus comes, if we start to build, well, that would give all these ones that you're going to church with or lost something to do while you're in heaven, amen? Did y'all catch that? Because not everybody you go to church with knows the Lord. So if you start a work and God takes you home, then they get to come here to finish what you started. Isn't that good? Isn't that good? Because, see, they understand that they missed the boat. But there's another chance. There's another chance for them. And we know that we can see that from the movies we watched back several years ago. But the Bible says, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. You know, and, 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 and I do this little illustration to help you to best understand before we have an invitation. It's an open window blessing. God wants to pour this blessing out on you. Okay, you're saved. You have the Holy Spirit. But you want that blessing. Then what is that blessing? What is that blessing? It's a blessing for now. For this time and this hour that God wants to bestow upon you. It's a blessing for Camelsville, For the surrounding community. It's a blessing for this area. This church is a work. It's a ministry. It's a blessing for this, this church, but it will impact the other churches that are surrounding us. Listen to me, it's not about stealing church members. There's enough people here to fill up all the churches in, in Camelsville. Amen. And it's not about bouncing from one church to the next church trying to catch the next fire. That's immaturity. Some of you bouncing all over the place like a bunch of jumping bees. Amen. You need to get firm and get planted and get grounded and where God has placed you. And get involved in what God has called you to do. And that's not to just come in and take up cue space. Suck up all the good music and all the good preaching and go out the door and somewhere you lost it between the end of the building and outside the building or the parking lot. It's an open door blessing. I believe that God has opened this door up for this area. And church, it's up to us. It's up to us if we really want that blessing. Because I believe as the window opens, it can shut. I believe there are times in the spirit that the window will swing wide, but then the wind window will shut. But it will depend upon how you and I respond. How you and I respond respond one of the words that that god gave us at the watch night service the other night was this respond respond how that we respond to the foot of this cross back a few years ago we preached a, uh, um, at marion county adjustment center over there at the prison and i preached on the basketball court outside and we had about 40 men that was on the walk plus about 40 plus team members so it's about 90 people that were there. And so as those men began to kind of sit on the outskirts of the basketball court, we began to preach. And the Spirit of God began to move across the yard. And men that were beginning to hear the preaching at the weight bench begin to respond. People were beginning to hear the preaching from the, the dormitories begin to respond. And right in the middle of the basketball court was a great big M that Brother George had already named the mercy seat. And so, see, I gather, we gathered that cross, and, and as, as the men began to, to gather, and God's spirit was moving, God began to draw. I, I told them, I said, listen, if you want 
to meet God at the mercy seat. And if you want prayer, and if you need prayer, then meet me at the mercy seat. It was 10 and 15 layers deep. I've never seen anything like it in all my life. These men hardened, many of them hardened came, and, and I'm standing there and I'm beginning to pray, and I just had a few, and I opened up my eyes, and, and the whole basketball court was just about full of men. Men that were incarcerated, but men that had came and, and responded to the Word of God, and, and many of them were getting saved and, and set free, and, and many of them are changed up to this day. Many, many of them. And, you know, and many of them joked later about it the next time I went back because, see, when they went back home, you remember back a few years ago when ticks were bad? A bunch of them got ticks. They said, you preach the hard, you preach the ticks up out of the ground. Amen? <laughs> and so they went home and they were pulling ticks off themselves. But, see, they didn't remember so much the ticks as they remembered the move of God. Yep. Thank you, Jesus. They remembered how God touched them. Because, see... When this thing is done, you don't want people to remember so much the 13-day experience as you want them to remember that they were touched by God. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That they felt the presence of God. <laughs> that they were changed. That they were changed because they come into to God's presence. And church, let me, let, let me ask you something. I, I don't want you to raise your hands, but I want you to know this. God already knows. So is there any rebellion in this side? What's this group supposed to be saying? You didn't have my back very good there for a minute, I had to remind you. <laughs> Amen? That old, old King James Version that says re-reward, that means I got you back. Amen? As I got you back. So, but God knows if there's rebellion in this section. Four is the number for the world. And I got four sections. What about here? Any adultery, fornication, theft, covetousness, stinking thinking? Amen? Yeah, that's my finger pointing at you. God already knows. So it doesn't, it doesn't matter if you care if I know, because it's between you and God. So what's this section supposed to be saying? <laughs> Let me get you on the right way here. I got your. What about this group? Is there any rebellion in this section? Any rebellion whatsoever. To rebel is as a sin of witchcraft. To rebel. To be in defiance against authority. Now, here's the thing. God's Word is the final authority. So it don't matter what you think about it. It doesn't matter what I think about it. It matters what God's Word says about it. And if you're dealing with any type of sin that is found in that Bible, then you're in rebellion. And the Bible teaches us that, it, that, that you need to get that rebellion out so that God can pour His blessings down. I'm speaking to this section, so... Amen. You're supposed to be praying for them. What about you guys? Amen. They, you know, they had it easy, didn't they? They did. But is there any rebellion in this section? Because really, we just need to be upfront and honest, don't we? You know, God does give us at times a spirit of discernment, and sometimes we deal with people personally. Because God knows what's here. And He knows what's there, and He knows what's here, and He knows what's there. But look what's in the middle. Amen. Amen? And church, listen, there's not a doubt in my mind that this is a word God wanted you to hear tonight. There's an open window of blessing that God wants to empty out on you. Personally, first. Because your walk with God is personal. Then he wants to pour it out on you publicly or corporately because you're one church body. And so see, a church body is one big family made up of a lot of little families. Amen? Amen? 
So if we know these things, then why don't we respond? So I'm going to be standing. We'll just make this the mercy seat tonight. Because see, one thing I love about the cross, the ground is always level. It don't matter who you are, whether you're rich, whether you're poor, whether you're white, whether you're black. It doesn't matter what language you speak. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. And if any of us are going to go to heaven, we have to all go the same way, and that is through Jesus. But I do know this. God has sent me with the word tonight. Y'all had a good time last night. Might have been expecting something different tonight. But then I tell you, God mess you up. God mess you up. But if you're here tonight and you're struggling with rebellion in any way, then I want you to meet me at the foot of the cross. I'll have our folks that are going to sing, Brother Greg and them going up. I'm going to have a word of prayer. See, this gets right down to where the rubber hits the road. Because God's calling you out. Amen? You've got to get to the place you don't care what anybody else in this church thinks about. Thinks about you. But you care about what God thinks about you. That's where you've got to get. You've got to get there. So let's all stand. That gives you one step closer. And I'm going to pray. Father, I just thank you so much for these wonderful folks that you've allowed us to come and minister to tonight. And Lord, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that this is a message that you wanted us to preach. And I know this, Lord, that there is an open window right now over Elkhorn Baptist Church that, Lord, you're wanting to empty out a blessing in this church. Yes, God. Lord, that will affect every member of this church. Yes, Lord. And by affecting every member, it will affect their families, Lord Jesus. And I know that in this church that there's many of us that have lost loved ones that don't know you, that haven't experienced a free pardon of sin and haven't been born again, and they need to be born again. And Lord, I know that. So Lord, I know that, 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 that they're going to continue to remain unsaved if we continue in the condition we're in. Right. Yeah. But Lord, we have to get right. Yes. And we have to have each other's back. That, Lord, when we begin to look across the aisle, and I know it was happening tonight, that some was looking across the church and they're thinking, well, that person's doing this and that person's doing that and that person needs to go up there and let Brother Jeff pray over them. And, and Lord, they're doing a good job about pointing their fingers right now, but, but Lord, they need to look inside themselves. Yes, sir. Right. Right. And they, they, they need to understand that you know us all. Start with you, God. And so, Lord, I pray right now, Lord Jesus, that as we, they begin to sing and we begin to gather, that, Lord, we'll come and we'll lay all this stuff down at the foot of the cross, Lord Jesus. And, Lord, we'll say, empty me, fill me, Lord. Fill me, Lord, with your Holy Spirit. Fill me tonight, Lord Jesus. Help me to be that man of God, that woman of God that I need to be. Help me, Lord. Lord, I'm not satisfied. I want more. I want more of you and, and less of me. And so, Lord, right now, I just pray you'll bless each man, each woman, each boy, and each girl that they'll just examine themselves. They'll just take a good, hard look at themselves. They'll be honest with themselves. They'll be open with themselves. And that, Lord, by doing that, they'll just get right. They'll just get right. And, Lord, I know that we make a lot of religious terms like rededicating and recommitting, Lord, they just need to get right. They can call it whatever they want to call it. They just need to get right. I know that they fasted, Lord. I, I know that they prayed. But, Lord, I also know that there's some need to meet me. So, Lord, as they come, bless them. Every head bowed, every eye closed. This is your time. You need to respond. Whether you're young, whether you're old, or somewhere in between. There's an open heaven, an open window of blessing for you. Do you want it? Do you want it? Do you want it?